Hello, this is Dr. Oviedo. Today we are going to review nine cases of esophagus. This first case is a full thickness esophagus. This is for you to review the normal layers of the esophagus. I recommend you do it in this area right here. The layers are, of course, squamous epithelium, lamina propria, muscularis mucosa, this area right here is the submucosa, this area down here is of course the muscularis propria, and down here is the adventitia. Let's go on to our next slide. This next case is an endoscopic biopsy of the esophagus. At this power, you can see the biopsy consists pretty much of just the squamous epithelium. Endoscopic biopsies only remove superficial portions of the gastrointestinal wall. If they removed the full thickness, you would of course have a hole in the gastrointestinal tract, which is not good for the patient. So you can see here, of course, this is pretty much just the squamous mucosa. There is a very small amount of lamina propria right here. Another thing I want you to notice on this slide is the height of the papillae. The lengths of the papillae are only from here to here. You can see they are quite short compared to the full thickness epithelium. This is important for when we compare it to later cases. Let's go on to our next slide. This is case three. This is an image of the endoscopic procedure. The black hole at the bottom is the gastroesophageal junction. This white tissue, which is closest to you, is the normal esophagus. This reddish brownish area here represents an ulcer. Let's go on to the biopsy. For this case, I want you to focus on the top right piece of tissue. At this power, you can see this is squamous epithelium. The papillae extend from here to here. You can see they are much taller compared to the full thickness epithelium when you compare it to the normal esophagus. This is what we call increased height papillae and simply represents an esophagus that is kind of reactive to some type of insult. Let's take a closer look here on the right. At this power, you can see there are increased inflammatory cells. This cell right here is an eosinophil. This cell right here is a lymphocyte. In addition, if you look at the individual squamous cells, they are kind of pulled apart from each other. You can see the space in between the cells pretty clearly. I'm going to show it with my cursor here. This is an appearance we see when there is edema. So this biopsy has increased height papillae, increased inflammatory cells, and edema. This is reflux esophagitis. Let's go on to our next image. This is another image of an endoscopic procedure. You can see here at the bottom, this dark part is the gastroesophageal junction. This white area up here, over here, and over here represents the residual normal esophagus. The large amounts of red area here, here, and here all represent the Barrett's esophagus. Let's go on to the pathology. At this power, you can see the right portion of the biopsy consists of squamous epithelium, which is the normal type of epithelium in the esophagus. The rest of this biopsy shows a glandular epithelium. Let's take a closer look. At this power, you can see there are numerous goblet cells. This is a goblet cell right here. Here's another one right here. Here's another one right here. The presence of goblet cells in the esophagus is called intestinal metaplasia and is consistent with Barrett's esophagus. Let's go on to our next slide. This is from the same patient, but is a few years later. At this power, you can see the Barrett's esophagus is still present because there are numerous goblet cells. Here's a goblet cell right here. Here's a goblet cell right here. There are quite a few. In addition to the Barrett's epithelium, some of the nuclei have kind of an elongated look right here and right here and also right here. This is what we call low-grade dysplasia. So the diagnosis is Barrett's esophagus with low-grade dysplasia. 
Let's go on to the next slide. This is the same patient at a later time point. I'm going to take a closer look here on the left. Here again, you can see there is some squamous epithelium over here, which is the normal type of epithelium you would see in the esophagus. However, this area right here is, of course, Barrett's esophagus. You can see goblet cells here and here. This time, however, I want to take a closer look at this area right here. You can see these glands have markedly enlarged nuclei, and the nuclei go all the way towards the lumen. This is what we call high-grade dysplasia. So the diagnosis is Barrett's esophagus with high-grade dysplasia. Let's go on to the next slide. This is the same patient at a later time point. I want to take a closer look right here. At this power, you can see the nuclei are very atypical. In addition, you have this very irregular outline of the glands. Also, you can see there are bits of smooth muscle around the glands. If you see smooth muscle around the glands, it means the glands are invading into the muscularis. In addition, you also have some adipose here on the left, which is also evidence that these are invasive glands. This is, of course, adenocarcinoma arising in Barrett's esophagus. Let's go on to our next case. This is case four. This is a gross photograph of an esophageal resection. You can see the normal white appearance of the esophagus in this area up here and down here. All the way at the bottom down here is a portion of gastric mucosa. This is a formalin fixed specimen, which is why the gastric mucosa has kind of a brown appearance. You can see the gastroesophageal junction is pretty straight. This specimen does, of course, have a large tumor right here. This is a squamous cell carcinoma invading into the wall and causing a constriction. Let's go on to the pathology. For the pathology slide, you're going to have to copy and paste the link where the slide is located. Here is our pathology slide. You can see the tumor up here, and down here at the bottom is, of course, the muscularis propria. I want to take a look at the tumor here on the right. You can see there are regions of abnormal squamous epithelium, which is very disorganized and has highly atypical nuclei. That is the appearance of squamous cell carcinoma. In addition, these areas around these islands of squamous cell carcinoma are smooth muscle, which is, of course, evidence that the tumor is invading into the muscularis propria. Right here, I just want to take a closer look at the highly atypical nuclei. This is, of course, squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. Let's go on to our next case. This is case five. This is eosinophilic esophagitis. Let's take a closer look. At this power, you can see the increased height papillae. The papillae go from here to here, which is very tall compared to the full height of the epithelium. I want to take a closer look right here. At this power, you can see there are a lot of eosinophils. There's one right here. There's another one right here. There are quite a few. This is the appearance of eosinophilic esophagitis. Please note that eosinophilic esophagitis has a lot more eosinophils compared to reflux esophagitis. Let's go on to our next case. This is case six. This is a case of herpes esophagitis. I want to take a closer look at this piece right here. At this power, you can see there is necrosis. I know there is necrosis because the tissue has kind of this faded look. In addition, there are a lot of inflammatory cells. This area right here is a little cluster of herpes virus inclusions. This is, of course, herpes esophagitis. Let's go on to our next case. This is case 7. This is a case of candidal esophagitis. I want to take a closer look at this piece right here. At this power, you can see there is a squamous epithelium. In addition, there are these very faint blue hyphae, which are, of course, 
candidal hyphae. You can see them a little better at higher power. I have a silver stain on the summary slide which also shows them better. This is, of course, candidal esophagitis. Let's go on to the next case. This is case 8. This is an endoscopic image of esophageal varices. Down here is the gastroesophageal junction. You can see there are these very large swollen areas covered by mucosa. These are, of course, esophageal varices. There is another large one right here. These are susceptible to bleeding when there is an erosion of the overlying mucosa, which goes into the varix. Let's go on to the last case. This is case 9. This is Mallory Weiss syndrome. You can see this area up here is the esophagus, which has this normal white appearance that the normal esophageal mucosa usually has. Down here, kind of pretty dark, is the gastric mucosa, and the gastroesophageal junction is located right here. There are numerous tears or lacerations at the gastroesophageal junction. There's one that goes from here to here. There's another small one right here. There's another one here on the right. And there's another one here on the right. This is, of course, Mallory Weiss syndrome due to severe vomiting. Let's go on to our summary slide. Cases 1 and 2 are normal esophagus. Here is our full thickness section. Here is the stratified squamous epithelium. Here is the lamina propria. Next is the muscularis mucosa. Here is the submucosa. This is the muscularis propria. And down here is the adventitia. Here is our endoscopic biopsy. It, of course, consists only of the squamous epithelium. This blue arrow is pointing out the length of a papilla. These are quite short compared to the full thickness of the epithelium, which is normal. Remember, endoscopic biopsies only sample the superficial tissues. They do not sample a full thickness gastrointestinal tract because that would, of course, produce a hole in the gastrointestinal tract, which we don't want. Let's go on to our next slide. Case 3, slide 4, is reflux esophagitis. Here is our biopsy. You can see on this slide the papillae are quite tall relative to to the full height of the epithelium. This is what we call increased height papillae and is a common finding in esophagus that is being damaged by some agent. This results because the esophagus is attempting to repair itself in response to some type of insult. Here on the right, you can see there are eosinophils and lymphocytes, which I have circled. In addition, there is edema, which we can see as increased space in between the squamous epithelial cells. These are the findings of reflux esophagitis. The clinical correlate of pathologic reflux esophagitis is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Let's go on to our next slide. This is still the same patient. These are slides five and six. Here is our endoscopic image. Down there is the gastroesophageal junction. This white appearance is the normal esophagus. The red tissue is the Barrett's esophagus. Here on the right, I've shown the histologic appearance of Barrett's esophagus with the goblet cells. Let's go on to our next slide. Slides 7, 8, and 9 still correspond to the same patient. These slides show the progression from low-grade dysplasia to high-grade dysplasia to adenocarcinoma in a patient with Barrett's esophagus. Here is our low-grade dysplasia. You can see there are our elongated nuclei extending towards the lumen. This is best seen here and here. In this panel, I've shown high-grade dysplasia. The nuclei are markedly enlarged and disorganized. You can see that best right in the middle. Here on the right, I've shown the adenocarcinoma. The glands are very irregularly shaped, and you can see they are invading surrounding tissues. The purpose of these slides is to demonstrate the morphologic progression from low-grade dysplasia to high-grade dysplasia to adenocarcinoma. As you go from left to right, mutations will accumulate in the progression to adenocarcinoma. 
Let's go on to our next case. Case 4 is esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. This is our gross photograph which shows the squamous cell carcinoma in the mid-esophagus. It of course is constricting the esophagus. Down here is the gastric cardia for orientation. Here in the middle is our squamous cell carcinoma invading through smooth muscle. On the far right we have the highly atypical enlarged nuclei with moderate amounts of cytoplasm which is the appearance of squamous cell carcinoma. Let's go on to our next case. Case 5 is eosinophilic esophagitis. Here is our biopsy. At high power you can see there are markedly increased numbers of eosinophils. Eosinophilic esophagitis has a lot more eosinophils than reflux esophagitis. Let's go on to our next case. Case 6 is herpes esophagitis. In this panel you can see the tissue is necrotic and there's a lot of inflammation. Here on the right there is a high power that shows you the herpes nuclear inclusions. Let's go on to our next case. Case 7 is candidal esophagitis. The slide demonstrates fungal forms invading the mucosa. Here on the right I've shown a silver stain because you can see the fungal organisms a little bit better. There's one up here, one here, and one down here. There are quite a few in this image. Let's go on to our next case. Case 8 was a case of esophageal varices. Here you can see there are large dilated varices under the mucosa. There are some right here and right here. These are, of course, very susceptible to bleeding. Let's go on to our last case. Case 9 was Mallory Weiss syndrome. This is a specimen which demonstrates the gastroesophageal junction with numerous mucosal tears here, 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 and here. This is, of course, Mallory Weiss syndrome. Okay, good luck with your studies of the esophagus.